but if you start the YouTube live now, what I would do is um, I would talk about the next speaker series. So it will be recorded also for people who um, who who listen um, later. Thank you. <laughs> it will give like a two minute to other people to to join us. I just tied up. Thank you. So welcome. The few person, hopefully other people will join us. I know a lot um, listen to the YouTube link afterwards, but we have the chance to have uh, Clayton with us tonight and to ask our questions. Um, in the shared notes on the left of your screen, I did share um, two things actually. I shared uh, the our next uh, Brilliant Lab uh, Making Different Speaker series. So it's a um, an interdisciplinary artist called Tosca Terran. Uh, she designed with nature. So the title is how can we collaborate with nature and biologically systems to make art. So it's next Thursday, February 18 at 1.30 uh, Atlantic time. So it's the perfect time if you want to join with uh, students, uh, parents are welcome to join. Um, it's always, um, there's always a, a period uh, for questions. So I have put the registering uh, link in the um, and I also have shared uh, the link if you want to be part of the Natural Maker Network. Um, I'm sending n uh, nice activities or um, training um, um, well, yeah, possibilities when we have them so uh, pl sessions and everything i'm sending that to the network and i've had j'ai ajouté le, le, le lien pour le réseau maker naturel uh, en français alors j'envoie un courriel en anglais puis j'envoie aussi uh, un courriel en français alors les liens sont dans les shared notes si vous avez uh, vous avez besoin des liens puis vous les vous avez pas pu les noter uh, vous pouvez m'écrire Michel à commercial brilliantlabs.ca Michel Michel at brilliantlabs.ca if you need the links or anything else. Are we ready? Do you feel like starting? Can do you think we can start? If you like. Um, sure. I'm, people can join in when they like, and others may have questions. It's always, uh, I'm always these days um, talking to usually the converted or people that are really trying to work hard. Ah, CM, itana siya, I'm all stale. Iet sat o alio, eten quanasquis, tang qualu itzen quan, tanitzen a kachunuk, quankan. at Konken Ikitsi Tatimo. Stealum te e stealum konken. Tania konken tatimo e out in a slack a load to Quasqui. Stealing Quanken.
das Wolle. Hey, Good evening there and where everybody else is. As um, my last session, I always um, begin and end with a song out of respect for the protocols here in Kwantlen territory. I live there. I am a settler and heritage and uh, from Scotland and England. And I've been told to recognize that I am from Kwanak. I recognized you as friends and respected ones, as good people. And I recognize uh, Kwantlen and Katesi territories in which I work and play and live. And I wanted to offer respect um, to them through the Kwantlen song. And so that's why I sang that song. So thank you very much for joining us this evening with this sort of introductory uh, to a question period. I want to um, sort of review what we've talked about a little bit and introduce uh, some, some topics into the conversation and then uh, we can go from there. I think that's a good way to sort of ground ourselves in, in uh, thinking um, and where we left off kind of. Okay, does that sound great for everybody? Oh, I don't see anybody. <laughs> Except for you, Michelle. <laughs> That's right. Next slide, please. So last week I, I talked about the the ideas behind the practice, uh, behind everything that every one of us does. Uh, it turns into a story, a story within stories, and a mixture of stories. And so this uh, place conscious ecological practice is a developing story and ever evolves and changes. And as we look at it, we have three uh, ways in which we try to manage the education in which we're offering ourselves and children. Uh, so we, rec we have to recognize the place. And the place is much bigger because when we start thinking about place, we think about community and community is much bigger than just what we think about as humankind. We have to think about all the different types of communities and, and both animal, plant and, and land communities, the water communities, and how we can build relationship with, with those. Now, we, in order to do that, we have to start searching out everything that we can know. We have to be outside all the time. We have to know the places in which we're going intimately through all the different seasons and their histories and knowledges. So the questions I ask here is what is that thousand year old cedar stories that's telling us? What are the 2,000, 3,000, 30,000, 30 million year old stones? What are they telling us? What histories here? Now the land histories or the water histories and then there's the, the histories that come through humankind and here um, we have settlement for 15,000 years. They have stories that we can, we can hear and listen to. And then we can build up on that knowledge of what this place really means to learning. And so I think that's the first step that we as educators or administrators or, or people have to get to understand. So going back, I have dug deeply into the place of Katesi and Kwantlen First Nations overlapping territories. There's others there as well. Um, the trouble is, is that it's hard to gather that and it takes a lot of work and we need to build that respect. And that's why I follow protocols that I've been taught. Now, the next number two is the experience. Now, we can't imagine anything when we can't really learn much about anything without having full experiences. So you can move away from those a little bit and you can, you can say somebody could read a book. They first not need to know how to read. And then, and then you could, you could actually um, do something on a computer and, and virtualize it. Um, there's no experience like the real experience, the real lived experience, the ones that you participate in. A friend of mine and I, the principal of the school, Randy Bates now, um, and myself, we went out. It was almost slushing in the snow when we were playing disc golf. And um, we were talking about virtual learning because there was a, 
uh, somebody that wanted to come to the school to try to record what we're doing uh, and what they're doing at the school. And Randy was worried that they wouldn't get the full picture if they showed them working uh, on books or under a shelter or something that they've done and built uh, when it's snowing and raining outside because they wouldn't know that their hands are slightly frozen. They wouldn't know, they wouldn't have these experiences. So real lived experiences are important and all in context, hands on and using all the senses um, are really important. So my question about things to come back to those senses. What are the senses? So people think of usually four, right? touch, smell, taste, and, and the ability to see or the fifth one here. And, and, and there's much more, there's so many more. There's, there's that spatial awareness, there's the sense of metaphor. I mean, and once you start thinking about it, there's, there's what happens with your sixth sense or that, that layer of understanding that develops and spreads within what we're, when, when we're walking through the woods or doing an activity. When you get cut with a knife and you realize that you need first aid or you don't, when you stick yourself with a pin when you're sewing, you know, you can't get that anywhere else except by actually sticking yourself with a pin. And so those real experiences are the second most important. The next is the teacher. The planned activities or the planned activities. Now, teachers are everyone and everything, and that's a natural world as well. And that's a whole different way of thinking that this natural world can be a teacher. So... Here we are, we've planned an activity, and then we have to mediate that activity. So I knew this boy in grade four that studied fungi. Now this, this student is in grade four and was presenting fungi in a slideshow um, PowerPoint presentation with um, this, her mom, his mom, uh, took him to uh, these different mushroom places and to UBC and to the botanical gardens and everywhere to see as many mushrooms and to study as much as I can. The presentation was better than most educators I've ever seen in fungi and he was in grade four. So it's important, right? How do you mediate that? Because I know nothing about fungi, but we worked with the teachers we worked with each other, we worked with specialists, we brought in people, we made sure the mom knew of people and she researched people to go to through all the educators, the mediators to this activity and the learning about fungi was the community. It was everybody. And then where do you, where do you take that information? So activity and mediation, as I mentioned before, is a um, Vygotskyan theory, it came out um, a long time ago, and then it moved from, from um, one sort of way of thinking into activity theory, and I think I should that. So um, you can see by the notes that there's, there's a lot to that. I wanted to stop there too and just mention emergent learning because there's a lot written about people going out to nature and just letting the kids be, and that's okay. And that's okay for them to become comfortable in the natural world. But the purpose of teaching and the person to, to have mediators there is to take them further and more uncomfortable into their learning. So they get more and more experiences. And that means for us at the environmental school was to bring in uh, indigenous elders and indigenous knowledge keepers and, and other knowledge keepers from the community that could help us uh, teach and grow. So emergent learning is the ability to change your thinking along the way in order to add and develop and design things for yourself to ask deeper questions about your own learning and then take it back to the kids. I can't know everything, so I have to use everybody. So that's my little review of that slide. Thank you. Next one. They go faster. There were a lot of questions last week about curriculum and um, I shared a few stories and then one of my last slides was stories upon stories upon stories that interlink with each other. Now, um, the, the thing about curriculum, it was meant to be a verb, it wasn't static. So somehow along the way, uh, everything was divided into subject areas and disciplines. 
Now that made it really difficult for everybody to start channeling 20 minutes here and 15 minutes there, 45 minutes there, an hour there into different subject areas when all those subject areas overlap each other. Why on earth in a classroom, in any grade, even in university, would you write a science paper and not get a paper in language as well? Why would you write a paper in social studies and not have the social sciences involved to get science, social science, and language skills? So there's, there's all these dynamics of in-context things that happen with activities that are really important. So that comes back to our activity and mediation. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, we have to continually change and look at the way we do things to, to focus on a specific activity. I shared with you shelter building, drum making, and uh, the other one was uh, maple syrup. And those expanded into curriculum that would be all together and in context with each other. Now you picture a story uh, where you build experiences, then it goes a lot further than that. So um, there is also questions regarding cu curriculum about language uh, development, language arts, and which is literacy and numeracy. Numeracy is a language, it's learned that way. So how does language develop and change? Language grows. Language, whether it's English, French, my learning in Hunkaminum, or other wanting to learn different languages, you participate in the language first. If you're participating in context with the language, you're on a fishing trip and learning fishing words, or you're lobster fishing and using lobster fishing words in the specific language that you want to learn, you would have a, an image and picture in your mind of what your words are attached to. They're not something outside of a real lived experience. So in kindergarten, preschool, they should be participating with kids that are older than them that understand uh, the language that's being used for specific activities. Then when they get to kindergarten and later, they need to be involved with older kids to learn bigger language. They won't know how to write it yet, but all the way along the way, they need to participate with people that understand greater language within a, an area. So that applies to mathematics and for us, our literacy in English. Now, if, if you were to say, okay, when do we start taking that language and writing it down on a piece of paper? Well, as we mentioned the last time, every child is different. And my daughter started to write and read before school, before kindergarten. Now that's because she was deeply involved with literacy her whole life. When she was born, we were reading her books. Before she was born, we were reading her books. We were reading her books. We were telling her stories. We were participating out, outside and using books that linked to the things that she was doing. So if she was watching Salmon, we would pull out a Salmon book and start reading her about those stories. So she could link about that. She knew then how to do her alphabet and how to write sentences. Then she went to kindergarten. She went into the French program. So she had to learn something new. Now, if she went into the English program, she would have been held to learn 23 of the letters. I mean, you guys in, in New Brunswick have a different uh, expectation in kindergarten, grade one and all the way up. They would learn differently. Well, in a school that allows kids to be dynamic at their own level, every child, no matter what level they would be at, would be able to focus on their literacy skills, the writing skills, the numeracy skills all the way through. If you have a grade two student that's already doing grade 12 math, then why would you hold them in that environment to play, to have fun and with their own age groups? And every once in a while, they need to go into that other age. So maybe they need to help the grade sevens with their math, be a leader. Now that's hard and some kids take it uh, differently. 
What happens if you have a grade seven student that has difficulty writing a sentence? Then you move them and give them, give them skills as leaders, teaching grade twos or grade ones where they need to be in learning. And you can do that with language because you're learning the oral storytelling and oral language first, and then you attach everything to it. And I think that's missing in a lot of classrooms. The connection to language with experience, the connection to language, that's both numeracy and literacy, and the, the connection to language in, um, I think I put part. Okay, so everything in curriculum need, can be addressed through the place itself, with the place, through different activities, themes, and projects all put together and then each individual part come out of that. Next question, next slide. I wrote down on the other slide that curriculum is designing or, or participating with the artifacts of technology. Um, engineers don't do this and they should maybe. So what we need to do is expose children and young, maybe even adults, to as many artifacts of technology as we can. You can read the list, and these are some of the, or most of the tools or artifacts of technology that the kids are involved in in the environmental school. And I believe that every child should be able to do these. Now, what do kids make when they go into a forest, specifically boys? Now, I know that's a gender difference, Girls go in and they make right now, I saw them just the other day, they were riding horses and the horse was a stick. The, what the boys made were spears and swords. Now they're not allowed weapons. So they were told to change it into something else. So it was eventually made change. But what they wanna do is they make swords and spears and things, because that's what they learn at home on some way or another. Now, if they know an axe or a, a how to use bows and arrows and they know how to use these tools and knives and carving knives, they know the effect of what the toys that they're playing with could have. And so I think that's important. You know that um, there, one down there is called digital technology. Digital technology is only a tool. And so it's only one of the other ones. So some schools I've been into, they only focus on digital technology. Well, they're missing the education, the learning and the experience that goes along with all these other things. How many of you in the audience there, um, they, do you sharpen your shovel? I mean, not many people do because you, they come fairly sharp and they chop through the roots and things that you need to do. Um, but, you know, sometimes there's things missing within our education that we need to be brought up with um, as we go along. So I think this part is important and part of place consciousness. What, do, what tools do we need in order to engage in learning out there? Or not tools, artifacts of technology. Next slide. This slide I wrote up because there's lots of questions about the teacher and I added the administrator and it could be directors and it could be at the provincial level. Most people don't have a clue what this is, what learning is or what, what um, knowledge is. They anticipate or they try to understand it through what has happened to them through the education system. And then eventually they work their way up and that's important. Most people haven't got a clue. And I apologize for that. I, I don't really still have a clue. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm searching and I'm researching um, to, to try to understand that myself. So I think all teachers know, need to know who they are, where they're from and what their story is and what stories they want to be told. I think that's so important because as a teacher, if you're not going out there to do your own searching for your own story, then how can you expect that of the kids? You, are, you produce in education a replica of who you are yourselves. If you believe in Buddha, you will replicate that in the things that you do. If you're a Christian, you replicate that in the things that you do. If you believe in um, Muslim or Sikh, um, you, 
you actually replicate that. So you still have to know who you are and who you've become and how your heritage has come and landed on this land. I know my family and I know what we've done to this place. And so I need to know that and reconcile with that. So as a learner, we shouldn't be, as a teacher or as an administrator, we shouldn't be all knowing. We have to be learners as well. We have to take that risk to learn. We have to know the place, as it said again, we have to know the experience that we have there ourselves. We have to push ourselves to learn everything about it. And we have to know how different activities to be there. We haven't even got any snow yet here on the, on the lower flats or where I live at my farm, no snow. Higher up we do. If you have snow, it's a lot different to trying to organize your class or what temperatures do you go outside? You as the teacher or administrator have to know that. And then there's policies that need to be changed. You, the system needs to respect and gain the understanding of what all this type of education really is, what this type of practice is, so they know that it can work within the structures of their bureaucratic and systematically programmed um, environments that they put in the co a conventional school. There's lots of other words down there, but I think it's important that you um, that everyone starts to recognize that um, I, I, the only words I can think of is equum, awits, and smethanin. Translate that to um, have pity on me because I am humble. I'm asking, usually try to ask or put out really hard ideas and hard questions because in order for us as educators we have to be in that environment we can't be comfortable if we're comfortable then we're not doing our job that's my opinion so next slide here's a slide that uh, my put, put up there for um people to read and sort of ponder and uh, to have as a background to the questions or the the engagement in this dialogue or conversation as we can on a, on a platform like this so is that good michelle do you think we're back into the frame of things loved it it was just i i i have the word word in french a resume the of the first conference it's just a what I see, Vanessa. What do you think, Vanessa? <laughs> oh, you're you're on uh, on mute. Huh? I will do summary. You can't talk because we have the change right now. Like Clayton is here, I have the list of questions that people have sent the, for the first conference. But we are here. If you have questions were can so we like turn on your camera or just open your mic and uh, we don't have to i don't have to be there to ask the question for you everyone can could just like start that discussion which uh, i see julie is here i i talked to her today so i don't know if sue has questions vanessa is there <laughs> I actually had a question from a family member. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yes. About the, because here in New Brunswick, our government is talking about uh, the multi-age groups. And that's not something that we see everywhere, I guess. And my family's concerned when I brought it up and I, I guess I didn't know what to say to them. So that's something I would ask you too. Was they were concerned about the social development of groups. And to me, I see how that works, but how would you explain that? that the kids still develop how they need to, even if they're in different groups age with different kids of different age, if they're really older, or like, do they get that support that they need at that age? Well, what's really interesting is that there's no, there can be no divisions between learning. So, and kindergarten kids are special, I know that. 
they can be so much more than what we allow them to be if they had the role modeling that was appropriate at older age kids. So they had, um, I still remember walking down this road to go to this place called Golden Pond where the kids, all the kids, kindergarten through grade seven, were, were doing studies. They were setting fish traps to count the number of different types of fish and to graph the number of fish that were in this pond. And so they were, they were asked by a group of people, an environmental group, to study the fish in this pond. So on the way, a little bit of a story to get to this story. On the way, it's a five kilometer walk. So this parent was amazed that these two old grade seven boys, tall and strong for their age, were holding hands with kindergartens while walking down the road and every once in a while picking them up to carry them in order to go through. Now that's our role modeling to say that we support our community, that we go through. So with that role modeling comes the ability to use language appropriately and what is the words appropriate for this given assignment. Now this young and old, do kids need to play with the same age group or close to that? Absolutely. But we found was that grade five girls play with kindergarten girls just fine. They still want to play with horses and they still want to play with, um, I was thinking of those girls today, horses and then the unicorns, right? And, and so they get to be more imaginative because they get to play differently with the older age kids. Now, sometimes the older kids want to be alone. They're tired of interacting with these little kids and I know that. The little kids are tired of these older kids telling them how to play games, and I know that. But that's where, in one of the slides that I showed at the last one, there's that sort of breathing in and out of these age groupings, right? So we, every clan or family is K through seven, now K through nine. And so then they have to split up to their learning groups sometimes, because if you're in K through seven sometimes, let's say, and you're only at a specific level in writing, you should be together in a group. If you're, so you have, and then that younger group can come together. Sometimes the littler ones can't kick the soccer ball as well as the older ones. So they do need to have that breathing in and out in order to allow them to do that. But multi-age grouping in teaching larger, not K to two or K to three, but K to five, K to seven. If you have middle school, middle school should be five or six to nine, mixed grades. They shouldn't be all in the same category. Now, as kids get a little bit older and more sexually aware, then there has to be this, this understanding, this, this long range teaching plan that helps to, to gain that understanding. Otherwise, grade, Grade K to seven together is the best form of teaching. The best form. Um, how many, like, how many kindergarten kids know how to dissect a salmon? They need support the first few times they do it. So after about the third time they dissect the salmon with support from the older kids, maybe they're doing it on their own. You know what's interesting about kids that know how to use dissecting knives and tweezers and how to identify the parts of a, a salmon is that these kindergarten to grade three kids at one time ha had guests that came down that were grade eight and nine science class. Now these little kids taught the grade eight and nine how to do carve a salmon. Now, if anybody questioned the ability to join age groups together and not um, just K1, which is a common split class, um, or K to three, but actually think a little bit broader in that, then we'd have much stronger learning. The school, though, has to work together in order to understand that breathing that I'm talking about, because if they don't, then it's going to fall on its face because you do need at times to let those grade sevens go in the bush and punch each other out a little bit. <laughs> no, no, not physically, but you know. Does that help, Vanessa? Uh, any other questions? Usually a question leads to a story because that's where it's better.
Hi, Clayton. Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm in New Brunswick and uh, I am curious about, well, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for your perspective on um, teachers searching for their own story and how we can model that to our students. I think that's a really important lesson for everyone to kind of consider in their process and their journey of learning. Um, I think one of my questions would be about your discussion about artifacts of technology and the importance of allowing our students to use those things in mainstream public school education where there is some apprehension about certain artifacts. Um, I suppose my question would be how, how do we go about um, bringing up this dialogue with policymakers, decision makers, to bring them the comfort that they need to explore and open up their minds to these ideas that you can have a four, five, six year old um, using a knife or a saw in an appropriate way if you're teaching them the, you know, and modeling the proper techniques. How do we go about having those discussions and making that change in the public school system? Mm -hmm. Carefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Within your own story as a developing teacher, I think people, um, their, their story travels with them. And so um, imagine me as a developing teacher, and I think I mentioned it in the last um, presentation that um, when I was a student teacher um, in the courtyard, I, I built a teepee. I didn't know much about Indigenous education, but it was the largest area that I could have as a classroom. Did the principal mind it? I'm not sure. <laughs> they didn't hire me, right? We built shelters and they used saws and they used saws because, and, and knives because I worked through it carefully and consistently and had an expectation. So there was a um, my daughter says that I was really strict. And because I was strict, I had structures, I was able to be freer in what I allowed them to do because they earn respect and they earn respect back. And so even from that time to the, to the time that I was developing this school, I mean, I realized that first I had to know an awful lot. And I had to know of the resources where I had to go. So, so I had already, uh, before I started this school, given a, a portable classroom at one time just for construction. And at that time, I had two or three parents that were really keen in being there all the time because they, they had days off work. Um, they helped. So it wasn't just me. So I had supervisors all the time. When we work with tools, kids aren't just allowed to pull out things willy-nilly. So uh, there, there's a, a safety structure, there's a, what's called a blood bubble, there's a practice and you, use of every tool. There's um, older kids with younger kids a lot of the times. Um, when, I, when you do big buddy classes in a conventional school with little buddies, then, then they can be learned first and share it with the other ones. So, Kids can learn to do it carefully. We also learn that, that cooking and using tools for cooking, uh, sharp knives and things were a little bit easier sometimes to cut up uh, um, fruit or, or some vegetables, to learn how to use and be careful with the knives before going to wood because uh, there's rules like carvers, um, carve towards themselves sometimes. But the rule is you can't carve towards yourself because if the knife, knife slips, then, then you're gonna cut yourself. Um, all the kids learn respect for the tools and then they also learn first aid so that if they got a nick, um, then they would uh, put their bandage on or help somebody else to the point that sometimes kids got cut deep enough all injuries need to be shared with the teachers, but at times they would just wrap it in a Band-Aid and keep working. And so we had to teach them that they had to share everything that they, they did and were doing. So 
the first step is to make sure that connections are made with people that understand the tools, that the safety idea and how to work into that and build respect for the tools, and then share that concept with the administrator of the school. Now, policies for a school and school safety most of the time can be different than at the provincial level because if they recognize the the involvement by grandparents or elders or knowledge keepers or or parents that are coming into a classroom if they know them and then their experience and they can share that experience with 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 you and and you've had experience with them and you bring them the ideas then administrators will go along with it 100 percent usually it's when, when teachers go into something saying, I want to go outside or I want to use carving tools um, and they don't even know how, kids don't know how to hammer with a hammer and respect the hammer or they don't know how to use a, a handsaw to cut the wood for their birdhouses that they're hammering together, then a knife is a little bit more dangerous. So, so it's a, a process of coming up into it all the time. Now, people say, um, Risk is, it's riskier to go up in a gradual level like that than it is to walk on a sidewalk in a busy town site. Because uh, on, a, on a darker day or a rainy day here in the lower mainland around Vancouver or Maple Ridge, um, it's more dangerous to walk on a highway or roadway sidewalk than it is to, to see kids working in the classroom if it's made safely. You wouldn't believe how hard it is to get a school to walk to the library or to the pool. They have to learn that safety strategies and the way to do it. It's just like everything else. It's a step by step. Some kids learn faster than others. It can happen with everything. Now, one more thing is fire, right? Fire is an interesting thing because we're afraid in many ways to share that with kids, the safety and respect of fire. So, um, in a conventional school, uh, most schools have some kind of courtyard where you can put fires inside a tin can uh, to teach them there. The environmental school can go other places and light fires. Some places they're not allowed to. So it, earlier on, before kids knew anything about fire, we brought in a knowledge keeper from Vancouver that carried fire in his knowledge and taught them all about fire. Now, when the kids saw him holding fire in his hand like this and placing it, um, we, we made sure that he explained that the fire wasn't touching him, it was burning on the wood above. He could carry this fire and light it, light fires in multitudes of different ways, including the bow. And yet, when he told his stories about fire, the kids came away with that with a different kind of respect. And so when they lit fires in the winter to cook on, or when they, when they started to say, can we light a fire and have a warm, something warm around us for a little while, especially in the winter on a, or on a rainy, rainy day, uh, then, then, they, then they would know how to do it already. And because those initial kids were taught some of these things, and we bring in that educator every so often, then that knowledge carries on through the kids through their ages as they're going up. And when older kids show younger kids that this is how you carve respectfully, or this is how you use a, a tool respectively, any one of them, even a, a computer, then, then, then it actually helps the younger kids learn that. And I think it's important that all those are used. I think um, I remember some teachers that were afraid to build a birdhouse and, and this organization built the birdhouses for them they cut all the boards. All they need to do is take the nails out of a package and then nail the hammers. Now, she didn't want to do that. So she invited male teachers in to do that in her class. Now, my question is, is that why is she doing it then? Well, she didn't want to learn herself. And you, you can hear by what I'm saying is she should have been learning how to do it herself and then show it to the kids or do it with the kids learning. Um, now, that's way different than what I would do things. Uh, Randy, the principal of the school, when he first introduced making six note pan, uh, flutes, uh, wood flutes, um, uh, Lakota flutes, uh, he wanted to only do it with grade five to seven. Now, I said, grade five to seven can do it, kindergarten can do it. 
And so we have to do is rethinking, you know, what does it look like to, to learn that process and move it along until you could have kindergartens using chalk signs? Well, that takes parents there, grandparents there, knowledge keepers, people that were woodworkers. One time we had 20 parents there helping kids work the tools. Eventually, when we had grade eights come back after being grade seven, they would come and, and teach the kids how to use chalk saws and stuff. Were we safe? Absolutely. And I think that's important. It's, 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 we, we, I don't know what, how to say it. We, we forget sometimes that all these things are possible and it's just how we move through it and into it. Right. And I think the, the, the better you are at moving in through them and demonstrating that the easier it is to change policy or to, to have your administrators just go, go for it. Right. Um, that makes sense. Are there any more questions, possibilities, angers, frustrations? I'll tell the story while you're thinking about a question. So don't let me interrupt your thinking about a question. I, uh, I was a bit strange as a teacher. So as I mentioned, I built teepees when I was in training. I had a lab for construction. Um, we built hovercrafts and trebuchets, giant trebuchets with, with uh, three, four meter arms, right? Um, they would throw watermelons and balloons across the field to blow up a castle. Um, I also did some really unique things by inviting indigenous elders into uh, little storytelling centers before I even started the school. And so when I started the school and got it going, it was impossible to do it. I have more experience outdoors here in Maple Ridge than most. I know most of the stories. I know histories and knowledges. I keep researching and searching. I keep on gathering as much as I possibly do time. I sometimes hear stories 10, 11, 100 times, and I keep on building that depth and, and joining in with that. And yet, after all that, they wouldn't let me have a school like this because I wasn't connected to academia. They didn't know it was true, the possibility. And so now we have a school that's been going, I guess, for nine years. And it's um, now it's an example. So it's an example that says this is possible. It's not like you need academia. anymore. But back then, we needed academia. We needed to be able to say, OK, um, even though that Clayton takes kids camping uh, three times a year, this isn't talking about field trips or camping trips. He, it's not that he goes one year, he did a field trip a week because the parents were so keen, right? Field trip a week. Same year we built the trebuchets. One year we built um, all these water rockets and water cars and went to this big, huge festival. Parents were so keen because because it, it was easy to make. Even with all that and all the teaching and learning that I was able to do within a conventional classroom, uh, which made me excited, uh, wasn't able to start the new school without academia. Now, academia was able to secure a grant worth a million dollars worth of research. They were able to get, uh, SFU was able to get um, a lot of people to support and help and teach the teachers and change the way we thought about our practices. And, and, and then after academia left, everything is fine. The, the school district um, understands all this. Or do they? Do they recognize that by grade eight, nine, or ten, they know how to do, they have enough literacy and numeracy, and they are good learners? Absolutely, they do. But do they really know what happens there, the pedagogy? Absolutely not. Because they don't spend enough time there to really understand it. Um, I mean, what can they do? So when, when, uh, the new principal or when I was principal of the school, when we go out there and we start talking to people, uh, they go, well, what do you do there? Dig in the dirt? What do you do there? Do you hug trees? Right? And, and they don't understand that concept that learning doesn't happen 
um, the way that they would expect sitting in a seat, opening a book and reading and writing in a piece of book or, or watching the teacher do an experiment or playing around or, or building even a birdhouse inside uh, a classroom. They do it all out there in experience, in context. And so if they saw uh, birds that looked like they were, they were in danger or needed support, they might ask to build bird houses. And then they would have to find out what's the best wood, what's the best size. They would have to do all the searching and learning to be able to express themselves within that activity itself. And so it's, if you're in kindergarten and you're already using measuring tape and sawing with a saw and making things in, into a birdhouse, that's pretty darn good out there in the woods when it's raining and cold or, or not and making it safe. So I think um, they still, in the whole community, I don't believe that they know what's going on in that school because they don't go. They don't, they don't learn. So. I, I, yeah, I have a question. I'm sorry. I, I yeah. have like a thousand yeah. questions and I, I yeah. like to ask them all. I'm listening and it's trying to time absorb to ask questions, Vanessa. <laughs> ask I know. questions. I know yeah. we're trying to be polite. So a little context. Um, I'm a newer teacher, I guess. Um, and right now I'm in an ideal position where my admin really believes in all this hands-on and the kids learning and not focus on the curriculum but do the activities student-led and then plug in the curriculum to the student so and next year what I'm uh, attempting to do and I asked for the approval and I got it was to bring my kids outside I'm doing it one hour a day this year just to kind of get like what do I need what am I doing and next year I want to throw myself out there um and i want to get the community the parents and all that but i'm always kind of wondering like what's my next step like i realize the clothes i realize how the kids ask questions will i kind of grab on to that i understand when you say i need to be the expert um like i need to know more than them to be able to help them to create but i don't know like if i'm getting ready for next year like what, what, how do I get ready enough right now? Because they're all kind of looking like, what are you doing? Are they really learning? So I'm trying to do this right. Would it be like to connect community members first, like experts, or I don't know which step to take next. Like I'm kind of, I know it's a big question, but I'm hoping that you're like, oh, this is really important. Start with this. <laughs> yeah, it, it is important because I think you have to feel comfortable and you don't need to be an expert. That's why you go in search of the community. And, and I always suggest, um, depending on community and depending how close the elders and the knowledge keepers are, the, the carvers, the, the type of activity that you think you're uh, wanting to do, and talk to them all. Talk to the, the stream keeper, um, the, the environmentalist down the road, or, or even your politician, you want to you wanna have the politician come and talk to them, you know, about their interest in the environment or what you want to do as education. Um, I think you talk to them all and then, and then you don't need to know everything. You need to be able to um, go to the place in which you want to take the kids. Um, and some people say, um, sit and learn. I'm not a sitter. I'm hyperactive and I move about all the time. So I move and learn. So if I'm taking kids there, I, I, I move and learn. And, and if you're taking kids and you prefer to sit, then you sit and learn and you watch and you study and you, and you search for what the natural world or that place is telling you first. And I think that's important because um, I think we talked a little bit about the last time too. It's knowing your, the place um, at all seasons and all the time a windstorm goes through your place and you have to know whether the hemlocks are uh, mistletoe infected or whether they're hypersensitive to wind and change in, in temperatures and, and what's happening there. You need to know about the, the area. So when you're sitting there or when you're moving through the area, you get to a gain in understanding of that place. You get a connection to it. When, kid, when you walk there or you sit there or you see, you're going to let kids play in this area. They're going to have high intense spaces and, 
low intense and no intense because you don't want kids to walk through that sensitive plant. And as an invasive species, there are species that grows more vigorously with the things, then you need, you need to know that. Oh, salmonberry here grows vigorously if it's crushed. Now, you don't want to crush plants, but kids, kids are going to be hurting an area. They are. They have to learn how to walk softly. So in an area that's high use, it's sort of like a ski hill or something where, you know, you need a high use area. And then outside that, you want to have less and less. And so, so by spending time there, so you need, you, you might even want to invite people that you're going to bring into your class to go for walks together or to sit there and talk about the space just to make sure. Um, one of the, one of the things that um, I was mentioning to this school close by in, a, in another district um, was that they, they brought and started building trails. And I can't remember if I told that story. They built a trail right through some sensitive plants. And all they had to do was build a trail two or three feet to the right. And they wouldn't have damaged those plants. So by being there enough beforehand, then you would know all those things. And that's important. So talk to people. Go there a lot yourself, and then that will teach you what can be done there. You're not taking the class outside because you could take your books outside and read poetry there, and it'd be awesome. You write poetry, and you could you could do uh, tons of different subjects there, and you could have a classroom outside, or you could engage with the learning of the stuff that's going on there at that time. And that's two different things. And so I think you're, you're on the right track. I wouldn't take it upon yourself not to take risk. Like you have to take risk as a person, not risk for the kids. That overall arc of the safe place is important. You have to know it, but you have to take risk. You have to go out there and be learning with them. So if you, you've met and talked to this uh, knowledge keeper or more expert than you at something, then you would learn with them. And you would maybe for the next five years when you're doing that similar activity or, or when the kids ask questions about that, then you would actually move, bring that person in and you would know more and more every year. You see, what always fascinates me about experts is um, we've ran into people studying salmon that they're doing their PhD or their post PhD uh, doctorates and stuff on salmon. And these kids are already learning it in kindergarten. So if they're learning it your whole lifetime, then you'll be learning it your whole lifetime too. So you have to be able to take those first steps. The other thing that you had mentioned um, was um, being expert enough to, to hear the questions. And I'm not sure if you meant hear the questions or you were talking about being expert enough to do the activities. And you don't have to be. So it's being able to hear those questions. And, it, and the more you're able to do things, the more you hear. And then the more you learn, too, that, that hearing of the questions. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say about too. Yeah, it's making the connections because of when, so I know enough to, like, hear the questions and, like, help them go forward with it. You know? And that takes years. Okay. Yeah. And sometimes as adults, we have fluff in our ears and we have this vision that we want to move forward with a specific something. And then you realize that that wasn't where the kids wanted to go. And you could do that another day because we have that ability. We could don't, if we don't do it today, we can always do it tomorrow. Manana, right? In Spanish, manana. <laughs> tomorrow. Or we'll weigh a list in Hun Camino. Um, so, um, you, uh, so we, you just expand on that and then do the uh, what you had planned tomorrow. Right? You have to have supplies though. If you can imagine the supplies that you need to try to help answer some of these kids' questions. It's amazing. So you have to, you have to be able to say, hey, I don't know that yet. Let's, let's do this searching or researching and we'll get the supplies and come back. Thank you. I see Tess is typing. I don't know if it's a question coming um, for you. Oh, yes. Elementary teacher from Chilliwack, BC here. I think my biggest challenge is finding the ways to assess on the curricular outcomes with meaningful activities that aren't just reading poetry outside. <laughs> I feel with ample planning time i could find ways to connect it all but i am looking for resources 
Sorry, rush the end of my question. Yeah. And wondering if you have any ideas of where to go or start. I think people should start with their passions. And I know that's a jargon term these days. Um, and everywhere you go or whenever you go outside, um, you, you it, it's easier if you say, um, let's, I'm just going to use an idea that just popped into my head because it, um, it, it it's fishing because um, I, I was running along the, the, um, the Vetter and then the Chilliwack River on some of those beautiful trails there just uh, about a month ago and and uh, I was just it was just in a, a nice way in the current of the river and and everything was going and there was lots of fishers there um, what an environment right and and if fishing was your passion then there is a lot of activity that can be put along there studying the river studying the current studying the understand the flow uh, when the the fish spawn where are the fish like to be and then if if you your passion was fishing then you might eventually tie flies get the kids to learn how to fish get start with a stick and string and move up into there as they make their own fishing rods with with uh, different types of wood um, i know new people that used to try to make make fishing rods out of maple or hawthorn um you know so so <sighs> The trail system along the Chilliwack River, and I'm using this because it's Chilliwack and I've been there recently, um, has a lot of unique features and stops at it, which allows, and the, and same with the better. Um, so, so it's just a way of finding those stops and spending time there to see where it can go for you and your passion. If it's, if it's, if your passion is birds, then you would focus on maybe the marsh area near the Vetter or other places, um, other places towards, uh, I'm trying to remember towards, uh, oh, the, there was a piece of the Fraser River. Um, anyways, uh, I can't remember. I thought it, thought it had a name of uh, Patithan, like uh, it had to do with the sturgeon. Anyways, it, um, it, it was, you know, there's not a recipe. And so when I, when I think about trying to design something or do an, an activity, um, I have to admit that I studied the curriculum from K through nine. And I overlaid the curriculum from K through nine on top of each other. And eventually some of my, my, my staff did it with math. And and from K through nine, it's exactly the same vocabulary and word in the curriculum in BC from K through nine, all the way from beginning to the end, grade nine. It's just more and more complex. So, so when we're, we're designing something or putting something together, it's usually a good idea to know where these kids place within those structures. And we didn't know um, how to grade kids, like I said, kindergarten kids using carving tools or, or, or dissecting tools and knowing how to identify, labeling, not necessarily knowing the, how to spell the words, um, labeling their parts and, and understanding them orally. We didn't know how to grade them according to the curriculum. So we were allowed to use learning stories and sign off those learning stories and where they were within their own learning, not the learning that set by the province. And because I was principal, right? I was allowed by my director to allow that in my school to take place. Now, learning stories are much more effective and, and efficient than actually um, standardizing the statement in which you make about the child based on their activity or reading and writing. Like I said a bit earlier, my daughter knew how to do basic reading and writing before coming to kindergarten. So when she was graded in kindergarten, when she went into French, she was more challenged and yet she already knew a basic language way above kindergarten. Now, 
what does that mean? A lot of kids are like that. A lot of kids come to school different. And so each kid comes in differently. And like I said on the last time, when we're, we're assessing them, administrators and, and directors need to know that kids need to be treated differently. And does that work? That's conventional, structured, bureaucratic, standardized statement that we have to make into a child is continually pushed from the system back into the environmental school. Now, um, in the last two years, they've had to do a report of standardization into what their reading and writing level were, and now they have to do numeracy. So how do you do that? No child and no adult can exceed expectations in learning. They shouldn't. They shouldn't be able to, because they should be always going ahead in their learning. And so um, what I suggest for a specific grade level is to know kind of a little bit before and a little bit after the grade. And then when you do activities, insert that curriculum into it. And I think it was uh, Tess, was it Tess that said um, she knew to, to read the curriculum and put it into the theme or into the activities. And kindergarten teachers used to be the best at doing that. They would do themes. And I don't know what happened to, to themes and projects and different activities like in kindergarten, because that should have gone all the way through school to allow people to, to grow that way. Once you have those inserted, then, then you can pinpoint them where they're doing. And so um, what the school, what the environmental school has done now too, is done e-portfolios. And e-portfolios carry the, the stories that the kids are doing and their learning stories. And the learning stories are written by the kids, the parents, friends and family, relatives. Um, they're, they're written by the teachers and they're written by the administrator, um, educational assistants, their support workers, um, indigenous support workers, uh, indigenous teachers, the elders that come and visit. If somebody says something, the teachers write it down and post it as, as their, their learning story, the children. So they've got lots of information. And from that, they try to position where the kids are at. And so to me, that's the saddest part about um, the learning is if a kindergartner um, or even a grade one or two or a grade two, grade seven, you know, they're doing so much more. How could you place them in, in a structured, narrow environment just to have data? It's not, it's not based on learning or science. So is that helpful? You can cut, is that, was that? I really, really like the answer. I, I just, Vanessa um, laptop died, but she just wrote a last question before it died. And she said she will listen to the video after. She asked, how do you go about planning a day in such a learning space? <laughs> Place experience and then an activity and mediation there. I always come back to that. Where am I going? What am I going to give to them for learning? Is it going to be a continuation of something they've already done? A revisit? Because revisiting, retelling of stories is really important. The revisiting and the building up of skills and then the learning of something new. So what, what's the purpose of this? Are the kids involved in planning this? Or is this answering one of the kids' questions? This is how I sort of start piecing together the activity and the mediation part. So when I plan, first off, for the environmental school, we're out there already. So we're already in the forest for two weeks in one place or three weeks in another, or we're out in the winter. We have um, a, a, a hunter's tent, canvas tent, or we have a yurt set up so that if the kids are too cold and we don't want them to get hypothermic, we want them to be able to learn, we want them to eat, we want them to learn, we want them to be warm enough to learn. Uh, they become acclimatized very quickly, much quicker than that. So, so we're already out there. 
So if I was to have a school base and needed to plan it out, I would have investigated, well, what's going on here right now? And what were some of my kids' previous questions? And then I would know, okay, well, right now, there's a migration of deer that are happening through the forest just up there. If we got there early enough and sat there quietly enough at a class, maybe we could see the deer go through. And if we can't, we can study scats, we can study footprints, size of footprints, depth into the mud. We can calculate maybe how heavy they may be, which how many were heavier deer than lighter deer that were moving through this area. Could there be bucks? What are we looking for for signs that if there's just not uh, females and does, is there a buck with them? And what time of year is that? You know, like this is a this is an important thing to know about your space. Now, um, in the fall, um, there's the, the leaves are falling, and leaves fall at different time in different space based on where they are within the forest. And so, if you've got a park near yours. That's an interesting thing to go there and observe for a while and write about what they see. And then the leaves start falling and they can calculate the approximate volume of the leaves and the trees and what ends up on the ground. Now, if it's a park that's not used as much, you can actually go around and study what's happening in the fall there. Now it's winter right now and, and here, um, just up where, where the, the students were the other day, they, they had snow. And so what do you do with kids on that first snowfall? And how would you, you figure out planning that? Well, first of all, you let them go wild. And, and because how else can you control them when you want them to be controlled? You have some control base and I'll let them go wild. Not wild to the sense they're not allowed to throw snowballs at each other and hit them in the face and you have a separate area for snowball fighting and then you would for building snowmen or snow forts or snow art. And then there's lots of kids, oh, I can't believe how incredibly creative they are with snow. And they don't even know they're doing art. And, and so um, um, uh, Michelle was talking about designing in nature and having this artist presentation coming up. And I just thought, oh yeah, I, I know this girl, she's in grade three and she's phenomenal. And, and she does flowers and then she goes and gets some sprinkles of paint, watercolor, and she sprinkles it in there and she does all this work and it disappears. Because here, snow only lasts a short period of time and it all disappears. So this all disappears and disappears into the ground and goes away. And she's okay with that because that experience, well, how do you record that? You take a picture, put it up on your ePortfolio and they show the parents the art that she's done. Now this, this is an incredible artist and I think she should go to Emily Carr next year and she'll be in grade four, right? Emily Carr, what, a, what an experience she'll have. Holy crap, she needs her own age group there. So planning, I, that recipe, that recipe thing, uh, pull out a card, find a place, study it and understand it. And, and you go through those steps that I showed on that slide. And then you, what experience? Do you want the kids to sit and read a book or do you have a story? There was a tree that fell down in this storm. And there's also a tree, this helping tree, yeah, I think it's a Christmas story or something about this helping tree that, that kept on giving and giving and giving to this boy. Um, and then, you know, like, do you, do you pull out? What do you do with this tree when it falls on the ground? You know, like, uh, in planning, you see that when you go to your space in your forest and you see this tree down that the kids liked. Maybe they had bird houses on it, or maybe they had a bird feeder on it, or maybe they came there to write poetry and, and do some different work and write about its size and shape. And they came outside and they were in, and now it's down because it's winter and the snow came at exactly the right time for the tree to fall or the wrong time. And what does that mean to them emotionally and feeling? And what are they going to do with that? What is the city or the 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 um the school district because they might own that property gonna do with this tree now then okay i would go out and do some resources i would look for somebody who owns a mill who is 
an official logger that has a license with workers' compensation. Who knows these people? I would go out and do that searching. I would search to help these kids understand this tree better. What are they going to make out of this? Maybe they're going to make gardens using the wood for walls. Maybe they'll grow trees. I don't know that yet. But my planning comes around this tree and what resources I can develop around the tree. And then I'm going to go out and do that research. And somebody says, well, I don't have time. Well, that's true. We all have our own little bits of time and, and our abilities. My goal was to, to do the time. Right? I had a daughter, so I had to spend time with my wife, my family, my farm. my And yet... I seem to be able to put in that time. I'm going to phone this person and go talk to them because in person is always better than, than talking. I mean, than talking on a phone or being on a computer. So, so then I, I could imagine, you see, because I've done things like this, I can imagine that that tree could become wood, that the branches may become flutes. I know that a specific size of wood can be cut down on a table saw under guidance by the way, table saws and routers are the, want some of the most dangerous tools to use. So with, for kids especially, very, very warning. Uh, we've ne never had an injury, but I think they're the most dangerous. And so most precautions around them. So, so I know that these branches could be made into flutes, these branches, the trunk of a tree. Now on the coast of British Columbia early, Early on in ancient story, they didn't have the skin drums. They came later. They came later as there was more and more marketing and exchange between different people. So, so I could imagine a hollowed out tree that was, that was thicker at one end in the hollow and, and finer at the other because they hollowed out logs in order to make the drum. And now I know a teacher that wants to do that. I've been trying to help him search for an elder or, or someone to, to help him make that. He's a musician himself, so he knows how to do all this and a music teacher. So he's, I don't want him to sit alone in his learning and just do it. I want him to have the, the resources with him to help him with the kids make these drums. So, so here, I've told lots of stories around my imagination of what could be come, come with a simple fallen tree. Well, in one school that I was at, they actually fell the trees because they thought they were too hollow and they might fall on the school. There's three trees that came down, giant Douglas firs. You could build a house with that. You could build, um, it was amazing. I, I think they chunked it down in blocks rather than falling on it. And they could have, they hired a company to cut it down in blocks. So I would have, I would have known, and if it was my school, I would have said, I'm going to plan to find a logger to bring it down for us in larger sections so that we can mill the wood and make the wood. Now, why? I, as a teacher and a principal, got tired of seeing kindergarten teachers have parents cut things out with scissors because the kids can't use scissors. They were, they were going to make messy art. Messy art's better than perfect art. And if kids are only learning to glue and color the things that are cut down, then that's not, that's not learning. They have to learn how to use scissors. If they have a hard time, they should do finger knitting. Because finger knitting, I can't do it. Kindergartners can. And I knew this boy in grade seven that was very learning disabled and he could do finger knitting. And no matter how hard he tried to teach me, I can still not do finger knitting. Once you learn how to do finger knitting, you can use scissors. So. I know that's a long answer about planning and, and ideas that move into uh, what you would like to do or what, how you would plan. I, I use those examples because I think, I think uh, first, we don't give a learner credit, a, a child credit for the possibilities. And second, we, we don't give ourselves enough to be imaginative and Really just go for it. How far are you willing to go? Go for it. Because if you come up with an idea, then all you need is the resources in planning. So I go outside and I see something, then I think, what can we do? 
let's make flutes. Or, or let's just make drumsticks. Let, there was musical instruments that were just sticks for a while that were coming around schools when I was in a conventional classroom. And they would tap them and bang them and hit things and hit garbage cans. And they would make all this unique music with these wood sticks. Well, make sticks. You know, if a kid, a child carved a, a stick into something beautiful, then, then they would hold on to it with deep respect. The, when, I, when I do conferences in person, I, I uh, many times give them cedar, a small plastic bag to shave, save the shavings, and a carving knife. Because what better way to, to learn when you're doing something and listening at the same time? Storytelling was done around doing, um, blanket making, weaving, carving, everybody doing the meat and cooking. And, um, yeah, so my planning is based again on those three things. Where are we and what are we, where are we? What experience do we gotta get? The place, what experience? And then what activity do we wanna do there? How do we need each other? Does that make sense? Is that good for you guys? Long well, answer. Now that Tess wrote, your answers are inspiring, not too long. <laughs> so, and there's, like uh, there's something Tess wrote something and it and well I'm not sure if it's a question Tess but I will write read it and Julie also wrote a question so maybe we can end with those two what do you think okay mm -hmm. so Tess uh, well I will read it uh, excuse me Tess if you would open your mic it might have been better oh, not a question just wanted to share my journey okay well I I will with my really good English so uh, she, she wrote, my master's inquiry is on, fi on finding my voice as a teacher after a grad diploma in place-based education and finding I wasn't following my beliefs when faced with collecting data on literacy and numeracy. I know I have to check the boxes of district's assessments and make sure the kids can be successful on these feels a little a little like teaching to the test uh, but that may be a conversation for another day but it feels like a push and pull either teach place or teach them to read at grade level i am working on finding ways to get them to the place they need to be for the district assessments using place-based pedagogy and then following our passions and the co-teacher of our place and now I am now I am will start looking I will start looking for their learning stories within our journeys together and she finished with good plan good plan with a question mark and um, Julie's question is can you explain the logistics of having the learning community log student learning stories so was that good that, English, Julie? Yeah, it was no. Let's say that again. Do, do you want to say it, Julie? She's right there. So. <laughs> so if I understood correctly with the, the student learning stories, you have the whole learning community participating in logging these learning stories. Is that correct? Is that did I understand properly? So what does logistically speaking, what does that look like or we're talking about um, e-portfolios, e are, is, is, are we using laptops or tablets? Are the teachers or community leaders, you know, grabbing these and writing into them? How does that look like? What's that process look like? Well, what I would have liked is if everyone has the possibilities to go in there and share what they learn okay. about the child. Um, it, it can't be that way. It has to be private. And so, what we discovered was the parents, the kids, and the teachers are the ones mostly putting in the, the learning stories. Learning stories come through the teachers, though, from the community. So if you're an auntie, uh, you can probably tell the, uh, the mother, and the mother can put that story in. If you're a friend of the family, or if you're an, um, an elder, or if, and you come and you're sitting in, in with the teachers around lunch and you're sort of having these kids sit on your lap and it's hard to get away from the kids when you're outside 
and that's okay. Then an, uh, and then an elder starts telling a story about one of the kids that is sitting there, and it's just absolutely amazing what they're telling. Then the teacher records that, not recording the voice of the elder, but records it down in a, in a point form. And, and they've been gathering stories like that for a long time. And I, and I used to try to really reinforce gathering those stories because a teacher can't gather everything. And so um, I, knew, I knew a child that would read at the babysitter, right? And the babysitter wasn't allowed to add stories to the, she would read really well, but hated reading with mom for some reason and hating reading with the teacher. But we got to know how much the child could actually read through the babysitter actually doing some recording on the phone, right? And so um, it was it was uh, something that we worked out with the mum and the teacher so that we could find out why the child didn't want or what the child could actually do. I knew lots of childs that couldn't do it. So, um, so we tried to expand as many as we possibly can gather. Converting that is actually quite easy. Now, I think because when you're out there doing things, you can gather more information about what the, where the child is at. Because for every activity, there's a story. For every story, there's something that can be written down. And so, so although you think, well, we're just outside, we're not doing anything, there's lots of time that the kids need breaks. And... The kids at the environmental school go to a reading session at recess or lunch because they want to read with somebody. They go to do some, some writing because they might want to write a story or they sit down and play school with the kids and they write stories and things. So even what's interesting is um, a couple of stories that the kids were writing on the side were sometimes better than the stories that they were writing with the teacher because the, the pressure that they're feeling is 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 probably overwhelming the system the the whole community sometimes feels that that um, the community of education puts pressure on kids somehow and the kids feel that pressure we need a writing sample and so so write you know um so i think um when kids are allowed to write stories that they've experienced then you can get those writing samples at grade level or above and when they write their stories, we're looking for specifics. So, so when, when we're, we're gathering things, they write specifics. And when you're looking for something to assess, we're, we're also looking for specifics. So, you know, did they use subject really well? You know, at what level? I mean, we know that um, a, a grade 12 student can graduate from high school with a C. That means they can write with a capital, they can end with a period and kind of write a sentence and a paragraph, right? And they can move it into a story form. Well, that's pretty good because that's what they can do probably in, in most grades, right? <laughs> Sometimes, right? And so, so, you know, it's, it's, you know, like we mentioned before, I think the learning stories hold on to their own. And it's that translation that we do because we need to know a little bit more, do a little bit other other kind of work than other teachers that just does the paper pencil pushing. So um, does that answer your question? Really? You know, like... Um, yeah, it does, especially um, when you're talking about the community sharing their stories with the, the parent or the, the teacher, what they've observed from the child. Um, that sounds that sounds good. I, I think I'm worried that the uh, the teacher will not have enough time or miss opportunities to to gather and you know to observe everything to or to see important milestones in a student's day or learning and and just where does that time come from to to log it. Not that I'm a student, like I'm not a data freak. I'm not like a oh I need to check this all up. I'm not like that at all. But you know, just getting the gist of what, what's happening in the student's day or life or period of time. Yeah, and, and, and like I said earlier, K through seven, and then sometimes you need to pull them out into age groupings. You need to, to know who they are and what they're doing. You know, um, sometimes you wanna teach um, residential schools is a good example. 
kids, all all people should be familiar for what we did in to, at residential schools as a settler group. Do grade sevens need to know more than kindergartners? Absolutely. They need to be take, taken aside and taught the bare line. They watch videos and violent videos. They watch uh, horror shows. They watch some things they should be, they should be taught differently. And then they're understanding it to the questioning, the answers, either written or oral. Uh, learning disabled kids shouldn't have to write. They should be able to tell their stories, right? Um, they should be able to go up through university telling their stories, telling what they know in, in biology or science or whatever it may be. So we need to be able to pinpoint that. Maybe the child knows the knowledge but can't write it. And you're right, we need to be able to do that too. And so it's that planning you know, what are we going to do? What is our activity? What is our day going to be looking like? And then how do we revisit that to see how much information the kids picked up? And so maybe you teach more at the first, you share more at the first with educators or other educators or community or knowledge keepers, and then you, you let them take on the role. So if you all of a sudden have a student that's actually teaching how to do that, whatever you were doing before, you know that they far surpass anything that you've given them a grade for because they're already a teacher, right? And that's 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 a key. It's hard, hard work. I, mm -hmm. I can't say that it's not. It's just different work. Teaching is hard. This is different hard. Thank you. Lisa is writing, I have been listening intently and learning lots during this conversation. Thank you for sharing your experiences. Now, um, it is 9.34 New Brunswick, <laughs> and we wanted to keep it at about that, wasn't it, Michelle? Yeah. So um, I think if, if, if you like, um, and you um, have been connecting with Michelle at all and through this and you have some really interesting questions or you have some some other things um, I will not pass out re um, recipes but I really want people to push back um, some of their conventional practices in the school and move differently think differently think of a different practice we're like doctors we have to practice everything, we have to learn everything and search it for everything and, and try to push our own learning and, and as well as others. So if um, um, I can usually be found on, I'm not on Facebook or technology at all, except through uh, my phone number and my email. So if you are already connected to Michelle, then ask her for my email and, and if they come up with any other questions or or anything. And after COVID, you know, I'm, I'm uh, available to help people uh, with different questions, um, especially um, as, they're, as they're searching to, to try to discover some of their, their older histories within the space that they live. Um, and I just might be able to offer a hand of where to look and how to find those answers in archives or, or within the communities, uh, the nations themselves. It's in our area. Thank okay. you so much, Clayton. Okay, so I always start with a song of respect and end with a song of respect. And um, um, I raise my hands to you all for for participating, and I and I and I feel honored uh, and gifted uh, by being able to to share stories and and listening to you. Um, and so I thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to steal them to e steal them schlock, yakula schlock. Um, the, the song is called Fly Eagle Fly, and it's the Liak Kulamni Anton George Quasquik. Quasquiks. He, um, uh, written by a man named Anton George, uh, was about Fly Eagle Fly. Um, it's a strong song, and it um, it was brought to me through Kwantlen First Nation, uh, the Katen and Esquiaten and the Sesmalox, um, knowledge keepers and elders there. Um, and so I'd like to finish in, in the, with that song, if that's okay with everybody. 
Um, I'd like you to take what you did, like um, uh, Thomas King says, uh, every action there is a story and you should carry your own stories really proudly and, and out front with your search and research. And, um, and so um, I hope and I wish everyone well with this. <sighs> Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you for letting me uh, respect the land here and uh, the people that live here. And remember that I am not Indigenous. I am a settler here respecting the, the people of Kwantlen and Gatesy First Nation for letting me live and play here. Thank you, thank everybody. Thank you, Clayton. Yeah. Have a great, great evening here. You too. See you soon. Yes. For real. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.